The reading's from the third chapter of Genesis, starting with the first verse. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat fruit from the trees in the garden, but God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it or you will die. You will not surely die, the serpent said to the woman, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband, who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked. So they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Here ends the reading. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Well, this is the fourth week of our series, Bad Dates to Great Mates. Started off focusing on dating, then intimacy. Last week was marriage. And this week, we're going to talk about temptation. We're going to take a look at how we can overcome the things in our life that will tempt us to step away from God's will. Now, recently, I read a story about a study that was done about, you know, what is the number one thing that makes people like certain ice cream? So they got vanilla ice cream, and it was a blind taste test. You didn't see what type of ice cream it was. They had gourmet ice cream, brand name ice cream, uh, homemade and cheapy ice cream, all right, really cheap stuff. And people went through, and they said which one they liked the best. And the number one factor that led people to like ice cream wasn't whether it was homemade or a certain brand or gourmet ice cream. The number one factor that led people to like ice cream was the ice cream that had the most fat in it. In other words, the more fat that was in ice cream, the more that people seemed to like it. Now, isn't that one of the ironies of life, that the things that seem most desirable oftentimes in the long run are the worst for us? I mean, for instance, why can't a chocolate-glazed Krispy Kreme donut be just as good for you as an apple. Why not? Or why can't just a big piece of chicken fried steak with white hot country gravy smothering it, right? Why can't that be just as good as Greek yogurt? But that's the thing about temptation and giving into it. It looks good and tastes good initially. It feels good for the moment. But later when we see that we have been misled and when we realize what we have given up when we give in to temptation, we end up regretting it. And when we give in to temptation, we always regret it because in the long run, we always give up something better than what we've given in to the instant gratification of the here and the now. Take a look at our first scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 10. It says, if you think you are standing strong, be careful. For you too may fall into the same sin. Remember that the temptations that come into your life are no different from what others experience. What that's telling us is that all of us are going to face temptation. All of us will even face the same temptation. And no matter who we are, no matter how strong we think we are, under the right circumstances, we will give in to that temptation. And today we're specifically looking at sexual temptation in our life. And I want to say to you, if you are living and you are breathing at some point in your life, you will face sexual temptation. And under the right circumstances, we all could fall to it. For instance, it's a temptation to be, for some of us, to be intimate, maybe before we even get married. Maybe it's just a one-night stand, or maybe it's the temptation to have an affair and to cheat on our spouse. Maybe our marriage isn't going so well and someone comes along who's really exciting, who's really attentive to us, and we give in. Giving in to these temptations can cause us harm. 
They can harm our future, the dreams that we have, the direction we think our life was going to be going in. They can bring harm to our family, our relationships, and our marriages. Can bring harm even to our faith, our relationship with God. You see, when we put our future, we put our future and we put our faith and we put our family at risk when we give in to temptation. So this is the question I'm asking today. How do we overcome sexual temptation when it comes before us in life? Well, to better understand temptation, we're going to look at the story in Genesis where the first man and woman, they come together and they're faced with the first temptation. And boy, it's a great setup that God gave them. God puts them in the the perfect situation. There's no sin. And um, they have a, they're in a perfect relationship with God, right? They're, they're conversing with God back and forth. They're in a perfect relationship with one another. Adam and Eve are never fighting, never arguing. A man and a woman who never have an argument. What about that? huh? And then they're in a perfect relationship with nature. Right? In the Garden of Eden, it's going to provide for everything that they're in need of. God says, look, you can eat of any fruit from any tree except this one tree. That's the only rule. You cannot eat from this tree of the knowledge of good or evil, or the Bible says if you eat of this fruit, you will surely die. And this is where temptation comes in. And so what we're going to do is we're going to look at this story today, and we're going to use this story to show that there are three steps that we can take to help us overcome temptation, three steps that Adam and Eve did not take. Fill in the blank now. The first thing that can help us overcome temptation is to pick godly influencers in our life. Now, look at the story. Eve is hanging out with somebody. She's spending time with somebody. Is she spending time with God? No. Is she spending time with her husband, Adam? No. She is spending time with Satan, the devil, the one that we know later on will be called the tempter. Genesis says, now the serpent was the shrewdest of all creatures, the most conniving that the Lord had made. So here we have Eve really hanging out with Satan. And I want to tell you, if you want to overcome temptation in your life, Satan is not the person that you should be hanging out with. So the first problem that Eve has is she's with someone who is pressuring her to sin with someone who's trying to lead her away, to step away from God's will for her life. Someone who's speaking to her, whispering in her ear, saying, look, it's going to be okay if you do this. No one's going to know about it but you. And really, Eve, look, nobody believes God anymore anyway. There's going to be no consequences. This is what's surrounding her, right? And The first question that I believe that comes to us because of this is, who's talking to us? Who's whispering in our ear? Who are the great influencers in our life? Are you hanging out with other Christians who care about you, who are trying to pull you closer to God, or are you hanging out with people who are talking in your ear, trying to get you to step away from Him? Take a look at 1 Corinthians 15. It says... Some may say, feast and get drunk, for tomorrow we die. But St. Paul says, don't be fooled by this. Don't be fooled by those who say such things, for bad company will corrupt good character. Bad influencers will always lead you to step away from God's will. And that's why we say to you time and time again, maybe you get tired of us saying it, and maybe this fall you're finally going to say, okay, God, you've been speaking to me, I'm going to do it. But this is why we say to you time and time again how important it is to get into a small group. When you're in a small group, you are with people who are good influencers, people who will want to pull you closer to God and not push you farther away, people who will encourage you right, to be stronger with the Lord. Now, take a look at the next scripture. It says, the woman was convinced. The fruit looked so fresh and delicious, and it would make her so wise, so she ate some of the fruit. Now, Eve isn't standing 100 yards from the apple. She's not even standing 20 yards from the apple and has to squint her eyes to see what it is. She is right next to it. 
She sees the shine on it and maybe the, the water of the dew from the morning upon it. And boy, does it look good. You would think when God said, eat of any fruit in the garden except from this one tree, they would have put stakes up and put that yellow caution tape around it so that no one would get near it. But they don't. She's standing right next to it. And the scriptures say because of that, she desires it. And to me, this is crucial. Because many of the influences in our life just aren't people. There are images and there are thoughts that we let come into our minds. And these images and thoughts are so important because ultimately what we allow to come into our mind will shape how we live and what our actions will become. Proverbs 24 says this, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your thoughts. Now, the pastor who has kind of the core material for putting this series together is actually Pastor Nelson Searcy. And each week he'll give maybe three or four, you know, some guides to, to the sermon. When I preach on intimacy, I didn't use any of them. But this week I'm going to use a few of them. So when I do, I'm going to give him credit. And Pastor Searcy says this. When we look at a scripture like Proverbs that says, Be careful how you think. Your life will be shaped by your thoughts. That what comes into our mind will ultimately affect how we live. He says that is exactly what happens with the sexual temptation of pornography. A lot of people think that pornography is safe. It's not going to harm anybody. It's only me being involved with it. It's not going to harm me. It's not going to harm anybody else. But eventually it does hurt you. It does hurt other people. Studies now show that pornography is just as addictive as when people get addicted to crack cocaine. Why? Because it will cripple your ability to have healthy relationships, to have a healthy dating relationship, to have a healthy marriage. And if you never let, stop letting those images come into your mind, eventually it will destroy your life. Because what starts out as a little bit of pornography will inevitably lead to acting, acting out sexually in ways that it will threaten your future, it will threaten your family, and it will threaten even your relationship with God. Now, if you say to me, Pastor Paul, I don't know if that's really the case. You have a real-life example this week, right? You have Jared Fogel, who was the spokesperson for Subway for years. And what did this man do? This man allowed a friend of his to continue to send him photos that were inappropriate of younger children and youth. After years of that, this man then led himself to pay for wrongful relationship with teenage girls. And now because of that, he will spend 15 years in jail, pay $1.4 million in restitution. His wife now is divorcing him and going to keep his two children away from him. What a fall from grace. All because what? He allowed images to start to come into his mind, and ultimately it led to such actions. Now, you may say to me, with this or with any temptation we have in our life, how do we get rid of it? Well, please, sometimes we as Christians, we do this. We come to church, we pray, we, we read the Bible, we even get into a small group. We have all of these things here in this hand, but we still allow the temptation to be in our lives, in this hand. And we wonder why we struggle with this sin. Right? What we do is we allow ourselves to stand right next to it the same way that Eve does. And it becomes so powerful that even when we know it's wrong, we can't help but give in to it. And you see, God wants us to overcome temptation, but he can't help us overcome temptation until we also take the step to remove the bad influencers in our life, whether it's people or whether it's things so that he can come in and help us, and so we can bring in other people who are going to bring us closer to him. So let's pick, right, godly influencers. The second thing is this. We must choose to trust God. I really believe this. When you and I have a temptation before us, we have two choices, either to trust and believe that, you know, how God tells us we should live, the path we should be walking down, the things that we should be doing, that we're either going to believe, okay, God, I believe that you know what's best for me, so this is how I'm going to live, or we choose another way. I mean, take a look at the scriptures when you look at Eve. Eve's talking to the serpent now, the devil. She says, it's only the fruit of the center of the garden that we're not allowed to eat. God says we must not eat of it or even touch it or we will die. 
Eve, you won't die. God knows that your eyes will be open when you eat it. Eve, you're going to become just like God, knowing both good and evil. You see, God gave them the freedom to eat anything in the garden except this one thing. And they had a choice right away, didn't they? They had a choice either to believe the one that had made them and given everything to them or to believe the one who had taken God's truth and distorted it. And really, this is how the devil works. He's called the great deceiver, and he's never going to tell us really how it is. Again, Pastor Searcy says it this way, but I'm going to change it and, and apply it to me. You know, I've been married for 29 years to my wife, Jennifer. The devil's not going to come to me and say this. Say, look, Paul, you've been married 25 years. See that woman over there? I think you should be intimate with her. And you should be intimate with her because your wife is going to find out. It's going to destroy your marriage. It will destroy your family. And it will destroy the Christian ministry that you are involved in. The devil doesn't tempt us that way. It's more like this. Paul, you see that woman? She sits there every week. Boy, is she sweet. And she really likes you. She's really into you. Wouldn't it be fun just to spend one night with her? You can, you can do it in a way that no one will ever find out. Huh? Just a one-time thing. Live a little before your life's over. You see, that's how the devil entices us. That's more appealing. That's more realistic. He entices us with half-truths. He entices us with distortion. And what I have found is that the devil will always emphasize the pleasure of things to the point it's so hard for us to say no to them. Let me give you an example. He will emphasize the pleasure of drinking, but he won't talk about the poor choices and decisions we make when we're drunk or how that can lead to alcoholism. He will emphasize the pleasure of intimacy outside of marriage, but he won't emphasize the results of broken hearts and broken lives. He'll emphasize the pleasure and the excitement of an illicit affair, but won't mention to us the possibility of a broken marriage and the destruction of our family. The, the devil is so good at getting us to doubt God and to think that God's the one that's lying, that God's kind of holding out on us and not letting you and I have fun in our lives. You may say to me, well, why can I trust God? Well, take a look at Numbers. It says, God is not a man that he should lie. He is not a human that he should change his mind. He has never spoken and failed to act. Has he ever promised and not carried it through? See, God doesn't lie. God doesn't go back on his word. But when we fail to trust God and his truth, there are consequences. Sin has consequences. Look at Adam and Eve. They sinned. For the first time, they felt shame in their life when they looked at one another. It affected their relationship. It would never be the same. When God came to them, for the first time, they feared God. Their relationship with him would, would never be the same. And their relationship wasn't the same in the garden. They were kicked out. They then had to sweat and toil and labor for their food. Eve would know pain in childbearing, and they would experience death. Sin is consequences. Last night, Ryan McAllister said to me after my sermon, he said, boy, Pastor Paul, this example fits right in with your sermon, so I'm going to add it. And I think many of you have heard about the Ashley Madison website. Maybe you haven't. It's a website that married people could sign up on so that they could have an affair with another married person. Over 40 million people in our country signed up for it. Now, a hacker got into their website and release then the information of everyone who is in, in on that website. So now you can go in and find out if your spouse was involved in an illicit affair. And now marriages who are involved in this are, are, are breaking apart everywhere. You see, sin has consequences. Paul says it in this way, Galatians 6. He says, those who, own, who live only to satisfy their own sinful desires will harvest the consequences of decay and death. What are those consequences? We have to remember that every time that we face temptation, there are three things at stake. Our future, our family, and our faith. 
The third thing then is even if we have godly influences in our life and even if we trust God, there's no guarantee that we won't give in to temptation because temptation is not going to stop. So what you and I have to keep doing is we have to keep choosing wisely in our lives in the days ahead because temptation is not going to go away. So I put down number three, choose God's best, right, for your life. Because when we face temptation, I believe there, there are only two choices. You can either choose God's best or you're going to choose something less. You're either going to choose what God's best is for your life or you're going to choose something that's less for your life. Proverbs 14, 12 says this, There is a path before each person that seems right, but it ends in death. How many times in your life and mine, boy, the path ahead of us seems right, it looks so fresh. It looks delicious. It seems like everybody else is going down that path, and that makes it tough. And we, too, have somebody whispering in our ear that says, look, go down that path, too. Take hold of the fruit. No consequences. It's going to be okay. And how many people hear this today? Listen, nobody believes the Bible anymore. Nobody believes God anymore. But what the Bible says, if we don't choose God's way, it will be a path that will lead to death. I would describe it this way. Many times in your life and mine, we either choose the path of instant gratification or what we would call a path to true gratification. And when you and I can be faithful to God's will and not choose you know, instant gratification, we can say no to it because we know down the road God is going to give us something that's better. In your life and mine, that shows that we're starting to grow up in the Lord. That's really a sign of spiritual maturity where God wants to lead each and every one of us. And so I want to say this to you again. Pastor Searcy suggests this. I'm not going to do it at first, but I really like this. When you face temptation in your life, either say out loud to it or say it, speak it in your mind. Say to that temptation, temptation, you will not take my future. You will not take my family, and you will not take my faith. I want you to repeat that after me. Temptation, you will not take my future. You will not take my family. You will not take my faith. Now, this time, let's say it like we meet it. Temptation, you will not take my future. You will not take my family. You will not take my faith. Now stand up. Come on, stand up. You should have it memorized by now. Let's say it together. Temptation, you will not take my future. You will not take my family. You will not take my future. One more time. Temptation, you will not take my future. You will not take my family. And you will not take... And you see, when we commit to approach temptation in that way, what we are saying, God, come in to that crossroad in my life. God, come in, and when we open ourselves up that way, God will come in and help us, strengthen us, surround us with other people, can be godly influences in our life, and God can help us overcome. Look at what Corinthians says. God is faithful. He will keep the temptation from becoming so strong that you can't stand up against it. When you are tempted, he will show you a way out so that you will not give in to it. When temptation comes, especially sexual temptation, let's pick godly influencers. Let's trust God. And let's choose God's best because anything else is less. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we celebrate the relationships of life and we celebrate the relationships of life and, and how you want us to live them. Lord, we know that there might be times when we have fallen short in our relationships where we have needed your forgiveness, we have needed the forgiveness of others. We pray that, that we would be, be assured of your forgiveness and that others would be led to forgive as well. And we pray, Lord, that you would help us just to reevaluate and restock in how we're living with others, especially intimately in those relationships, and to trust you and to believe in you that you know what is best for us, and to go forward, Lord, being just 
uh, a testimony of your will that others can see and knowing the fulfillment that you desire for us with others. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.